saying um, that uh, Su Susanna or Suzanne, that your family claims they have, um, you know, ancient Spanish roots. I wonder if you have done your DNA and there's any mm -hmm. Sparty in there. And I asked that because I did mine. And of course, I I know they're all Sparty and it came up 18% Ashkenaz. So I don't know where that came from. So maybe it came from Poland. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, maybe they married there and then uh, continued. Okay, I'm going to try to send him one more time. Okay. Well, and keep keep throwing it in there, please, everybody who was just coming now. You know, um, so the question is, how much Sephardic DNA is enough to make a connection? So when you look, when you're looking at DNA that's anywhere like one, two, and even three percent, it's a lot of noise. Um, they, uh, DNA experts call that background noise. So I think that any time that you're over, you know, four and a half, five, but it's also, if you're looking, not the Spartan that left Spain, but people like me, whose family stayed in the country, um, those people like me are not yet um, doing DNA tests. They're sitting in the Catholic Church. They don't know that this is all flying around behind them. So we tend to have very few uh, matches. So it's a combination for, for crypto Jewish descendants like me. It's a combination of a very high um, Spanish Portuguese, like mine is 92%. And, um, and then, you know, origins from places like Sardinia or uh, Morocco, you're matching people from Morocco, you're matching people from Algeria. And remember that a lot of people, you have to self identify as Spartic. So if you, when I initially did my DNA, I did it before I knew that I had a Jewish uh, lineage. So I did not self-identify as a, as a Sparty. So it's, it's a combo, but I'd say that at four and a half, five, you start, and then you look at the global picture of, you know, where's the matches and definitely Algeria, um, Morocco, in, in Morocco, Turkey, or, and I also, I don't know, I matched some Bedouins in Israel, so I'm not sure about that. I know, right? <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess they could have been in the Arabian Peninsula and married in or just been... Well, you Jews. know what? It's definitely Semitic. Um, yeah. Any way you, you look at it. Yeah, the uh, actually Sephardic, uh, Eric, uh, Sephardi is a surprise in general. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they migrated up. So definitely, um, there's, there's people that speak on that. And if you want to ask me, you know, via my website, geniemelgrom.com, you can contact me. I can give you the people that speak to that. I, I don't know too much about that, but I know, um, that there have been a lot of people that speak to that. You want to get started? Um, yes, I would like to get started. So I'm going to say welcome officially to those who are here and those who come in later won't get the official welcome. Uh, thank you all for being on time and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I am quite excited. It's just immersing in another experience together with uh, Jeannie is just, just wonderful. And I'm already saying it before I've heard the talk. So <laughs> afterwards, I'm sure I'll say it even more. Um, but in the meantime, just some logistics, your cameras and your cameras and, um, and microphones are off for now. Jeannie will give her presentation. When she is done with her presentation, we will encourage you to open your microphones and your cameras. Be aware that it is being recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, don't open. But I'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A as well. So if you have questions, you can also throw them into there. Uh, but we do want to allow her to go through her presentation as much as possible. Um, and thank you all those who haven't yet thrown in the chat where you're from, where your family's from, both. Please do that. And now I know you did not come to hear me, so I'm just going to officially, um, in short, introduce Jeannie because she doesn't really need an introduction. Um, but she was, Jeannie Milgram was born in Havana, Cuba, into a Roman Catholic family of Spanish ancestry. In an unparalleled work of genealogy, she fully documented her unbroken maternal lineage, 22 generations, which every time I tell it to somebody, they're blown away, which 
So every time I say it, I'm blown away. She has traveled extensively into Formosal, the village of her ancestors, in the Zamora region of Spain while doing field research on the past Jews of Formosal and its surroundings. She's the past president of the Jewish Genial. Uh, yes, right behind her, if you all look. <laughs> if you're wondering where she is, she's not really there, but it's in her heart. She is the past president of the Jewish Genealogical Society of Greater Miami and Society for Crypto Judaic Studies, and current president of Tarbut Sfarad Firmasel in Spain. Most importantly, I think she's the author of uh, My 15 Grandmothers, as well as How I Found My 15 Grandmothers, which is a step by step guide of how she did that, and her latest, Pyre to Fire. The books have won the 2015 and 2018 Latino Author Book Awards, not Jewish necessarily, just Latino Author Book Awards, and many other presentations and works that she has written and spoke about, and you can find her all over and her website, and I will send that out tomorrow to those who don't have it. But Again, you haven't come to hear me, so I'm going to hand the stage over to Jeannie. Thank you so much again for coming. I also want to add one more thing, is thank you to our co-host, who unfortunately is having some technical issues, um, but the Jewish Heritage Alliance, thank you very much for co-hosting this with us, and Michael Steinberger. So hopefully we'll see him later on. Over Wonderful. To you, thank you so much, Dora. And uh, yes, this is the village of my ancestors. The house all the way to the back was where my 15th grandmother lived. So I, I, I speak to this topic today from obviously from finding my 22 grandmothers meant finding Jewish documentation to prove that they were Jews because up until 1510 and the 15 grandmothers, which is when I started writing, there was only 15 grandmothers and the last one was linked a Jewish lineage. I continued to go back to find the Jewish name of the family, actually. I, I didn't really have to prove, you know, I, I, I received a certificate from Israel that I was born Jewish. And, and uh, so you can read up on my story. You would know I had already converted before that. But the reality is, is that I continued to 1405 in search of the Jewish family name. And that search took me only into inquisition documents and uploading data to share with other people, which is actually now up on jewishgen.org where they, uh, I gifted them the 55,000 bits of data that I put in there. And this is where a lot of my information comes from. So in this village where my family lived for 623 years as they went back and forth, hiding from the inquisition, and in their inquisition documents and a myriad of others is where this information comes from. So I will um, share this with you. And I think always it's a lot better to, to just see it. And this way you can, um, you can uh, you know, come along with me into the dungeons and maybe it's not the best place to be, um, on a Tuesday, but there we are. This is the logo of the Inquisition, and, and I, I will show it to you later in contact. This is the logo of the Spanish Inquisition. The logo of the Portuguese Inquisition was um, very similar. And I will also share with you um, information on how it looks today, because I have pictures of how it looks today. And maybe before we get started, I see that Michael Steinberger is here from um, the Jewish Heritage Alliance. And before we start, Michael, do you want to say a few words? Are you there? Uh, I, actually, I just logged on now, the second. I, so maybe I at the end? We had some problems. Now I'm just going to wish you Godspeed. Uh, obviously, we support your work. You're, we consider this work very relevant. So thank you for acknowledging me, but it's your show. All right, thank you so much. So we will start here. We're gonna be discussing the Spanish and the Portuguese Inquisition as both extended outward from their countries and settled itself and many others. So every time that the Spaniards or the Portuguese would conquer a nation, along with it would go the Inquisition. So um, it was established in 1478 by the Catholic Kings uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. And the goal was to maintain a Catholic only kingdom. There's a lot of excuses and there's a lot of rhetoric and there's a lot about it. But the reality is historically, 
was that they wanted to maintain a Catholic only kingdom. The problem was that this was the golden age of Spain. And what made it the, the golden age were the existence of the Moors and the Jews, as well as other Christian religions that were there, Anglican and, and there were Lutheran, which were really looked down upon. So the golden age is really what they were killing when they were chasing out the Moors and the Jews. And as we know, there was a serious decline after they kicked it all out. So um, they also wanted to get rid of a lot of the false conversions that had risen and people were uh, practicing their religions underground, the Moors and the Jews. So the Moors eventually left, but the Jews stayed underground and practiced their religions in secret like my ancestors did that. So they wanted to just weed all this out. However, as time passed, the crimes that those arrested were being accused of were sometimes so tiny and seemed insignificant, like eating beans on the wrong day could land you in prison. And I mentioned that one because that's something that one of my ancestors literally got put into uh, prison uh, and, and actually at the end died. So what does that mean, eating beans on the wrong day? So Sephardi Jews have a um, history of eating beans when they're in mourning, when they're sitting shiva. So they, and the, and the Christians and Catholics would be eating beans on festive occasions. So if you sat there and ate beans for seven days in mourning, then obviously you were not, uh, let's say, uh, Catholic. So they were getting caught for this kind of stuff and, and they were landing in prison. So I, um, I had the, I had the, uh, let's say, uh, I was very lucky in that I've been able to see the Inquisition as a whole from a bird's eye view. Many people, many historians, they study the Spanish, they study the Portuguese, the one in Mexico, the Lima, whatever it is, and rarely step outside of that. But I think that I was very lucky in being able to, to look at the whole thing and compare and contrast and again, I am not an inquisition expert. I'm giving you what I have gleaned and learned from my work of the last decade. And I'm sure that it goes a lot deeper and I'm sure that comparing and contrasting, mine is done at a very, um, let's say at a very um, a small level. Uh, Drora, I seem to have, okay, let me see. So how did it begin the inquisition? Um, these are many multifaceted areas of study that people study about the Inquisition. How did it begin? How and why did it spread from country to country? How were people captured? What were the accused crimes as pertains to the crypto Jews or the conversos? What happened in the Inquisition dungeons? Was there communication with the outside world? Why did some people escape death and others not? How did the world respond during those hundreds of years? How did this affect future generations? I'll be covering the prisons, but not the torture. And I must uh, tell you that uh, I'll cover the crimes and the communication. I have a many 45 to 50 family members that were martyrs and were burned at the stake for not converting. And I've read and read and read the torture, everything else. It affects me greatly. It's a very difficult uh, thing to talk about. While I get it, it's 600 years ago today. Um, a lot of that stuff remains with us, for example. Uh, and and I'm, I'm doing a study with the IIJG in Israel on this. Um, I'm deathly, deathly afraid of fire. Um, many of my relatives were burned. You know, obviously there's DNA, genetic memory. So I read it scholastically. I try not to talk about it. So excuse me for leaving out the torture, but it's just not something that I'd like to talk about right now. Um, you know, Drora, I'm, I'm getting frozen. Okay. Um, I'll try one more time. Okay, here it goes. I want to show you where were the tribunals of the the Spanish-Portuguese Inquisition and the date that they were 
um, instituted. Why is this important? Because there were Inquisition offices in every single village around the world and in Spain and Portugal. These are the dates. And outside, they were in Cartagena, Colombia. They were in Lima, Peru, Mexico City, in Naples, in Italy, in Goa, India. But this is important because only where there was a physical tribunal would they be doing the hangings and the, and the, the burning and the big uh, fairs to burn the people and things like that. In the other tribunals, they would be kind of giving uh, a, a, a little bit of a background. They would take their testimonies and then they'd ship them off to one of these cities. If you're chasing your uh, genealogy, by the way, and your family, uh, you chase it back to one of these cities here, I would say you're in luck because a lot is written and there's so much if they were from here, if they were from somewhere else and taken to these locations, then uh, it's uh, actually uh, less. Um, you know, Dora, I think it would just be best if we just uh, go to you sharing it and um, and we go for a minute. Okay, no problem. I have it open. I just need to. Excuse me, everybody. Sorry. Sorry for the technical difficulty. So I will tell you uh, when to. Okay. So, uh, Dora, uh, next. Okay, so the workings of the Inquisition in Spain. The Grand Inquisitor was the head of the Inquisition. Um, the first Grand Inquisitor in Spain, and this is the name that, if you know a little of the history, always resounds with it, was Tomás de Torquemada. He had a council of five to six members called the Council of the Suprema, who were picked by the Inquisitor himself and the government. So you could already see how he picked his buddies, right? So they met every day. The morning sessions covered the major crimes of faith, such as heretics, and the afternoon sessions, smaller crimes, bigamy, uh, sodomy, and other such sexual crimes, uh, witchcraft. Fourteen tribunals fed into the Suprema. Initially, they were placed in cities that were reported to have high incidence of conversos and other heretics, but later the locations were permanent, as shown in the chart before. Typically, each tribunal had two inquisitors and a prosecutor. One of the inquisitors was known as an alguacil, and he was responsible for jailing, detaining, torturing those that were brought in. Each tribunal was similarly set up around Spain. It worked. They just cloned it, and they cloned it when they went overseas. The sentencing took place at these famous auto da fez, which were huge. I mean, just imagine a Renaissance fair in your city. And it's huge and it's festive and people are bedazzled and bedecked with ribbons and, and pretty hats. That's what was going on. That's where the people were being sentenced and burned at the stake. And they would come early in the morning. They would be making food and, you know, you could just smell the food. And they made a lot of food because at the end they wanted to, to get rid of the smell of the burning bodies. Um, many historians say that the sentencing and executions were separate, but most agree that they took place on the same day. As I've read these Inquisition documents, I've seen that they pretty much took place on the same day. So many people ask, was there any way to get out of this? Was there any way to, once you were being walked out into this festive uh, environment, you wore, um, you wore a sort of uh, gown they gave you? That was called a San Benito, and it said what your crime was on the back. They had like a logo for each crime. And the only way that you could have any kind of benevolence at the last minute is if you renounced Judaism and accepted Catholicism in front of the funeral pyre, they would uh, cut your head off so that you wouldn't feel the flames. So that was the choice. Just go directly and burn to death and or accept Christianity and get your head chopped off and then they would burn you. They would even, the people that had died in the Inquisition prison, they would take boxes of their bones and there are record numbers of people that were burned in effigy and they would make um, armatures of the person if they escaped the prison and um, had gone elsewhere. There are very few of those. Uh, next.
procesos. From the moment a person met with the tribunal, the minute he was going in there, a judge picker file known as a proceso was written up. To this day, in archives around the world, they are still known as procesos. It's an important word because if you're looking for Inquisition documents, the word is procesos. They, they really are not called anything else. These procesos all followed a very similar pattern. They were written on Pergamino on both sides and in the language of the country of the tribunal, Portuguese or Spanish. They started with basic information on the person and went into full genealogies that are usually found right at the very beginning of the document, right at the very beginning. So this is how people ask, how do you get your genealogy? So <clears throat> the people were so frightened, they were so scared, this was so intimidating they just sang like canaries. It's an American expression, but they were just saying, so this is the father and this is the mother. And oh my gosh, I have an aunt that lives in this place and that place. And the inquisition just wrote everything down. Um, so it contains a thorough description of the crime, the accusers and the testimonies. And it contains physical descriptions also. So my aunt that lives in Lisbon, she's very heavy. She's got blonde curly hair and she knits for a living. In other words, they gave so much information that they went after the families, which is why the minute one of your relatives got caught in the Inquisition, your names, uh, you started moving around and your names started changing. And I cover this a lot in my book, Fire to Fire, which Dora mentioned, because the information in my book, Fire to Fire, it comes from these processos. I had to fill in the blanks to make it a fiction, but it's 85% information that came from the processos where people were going back and forth and how they were changing your name. So that was the moment that the people that were outside of the prisons, the names started like it used to be Martinez and now it's Alvarez, whatever it was. And they just changed their names because of these genealogies. Um, so the proceso continues with the torture, more questioning on other family members. They were big on the family members. Being in and outs of the prison cells, like every time they were thrown into prison, taken out of prison, thrown into prison, it's recorded in these uh, procesos and continues in this way until the person was either exonerated or sent to be punished further by the secular arm of the country. Uh, the Catholic Church did not and the king, the Catholic kings, did not want to be associated with torture or death. So they made up this little game where they would give it to the secular arm of the country, and in the secular arm, they would be doing the judgments. But lo, they got there because of the Catholic king. So these processes are extremely similar and very, very consistent. They could range from 100 pages to 500 pages and more. They are still available in the archives of Spain, Portugal, Mexico, Lima, and Cartagena. Since 2015, I've been spearheading a project to digitize, and um, I got funding from Israel to digitize all the Inquisition documents in the world. I only received the contract from Portugal uh, in August during the pandemic. We put the scanners in place and April the 1st of this year, we moved the scanners into the Portuguese archives and we already have two very large reels and we're hoping that the digitization of this um, will help others around the world not have to dig with their fingernails like I did for this information. And um, they will be indexed and you can search through them and they will be available online. And from Spain, it took me until last week when I received the contract to digitize Spain. It's still at the lawyers. And I'm hoping to, to have a breakthrough with Mexico as well. And then I'll head back to Lima and Cartagena and get these procesos up online. This belongs to the world. Um, Dora? Okay, so this is what a proceso looks like today. Um, you can see that it's falling apart. They have to be restored. And you can see on the right, they're hand bound. They're pergaminos, they're written on both sides. Uh, they've been eaten through. Uh, funny enough, the ones in the worst shape are the ones in Portugal. And this is the restoration laboratory in Portugal. We are talking 
this is big. We're not talking, you know, somebody, every single one of those stations is somebody like you see here on the left and they are meticulously putting paper behind it and meticulously. So every single pergamino, which is one sheet of pergamino is being restored in this fashion. And each one has 500 pages written on both sides. Right now we are uploading, I believe it was 8 million images in, uh, which is low, but they had some up already, 8 million. And we are uh, going in, in my first phase in Spain, we are uploading 5 million images. So um, this is what this work looks like. Uh, Dora? Okay, crimes that led to arrests, imprisonment, um, and oftentimes death. Bathing away a baptism, not being a Catholic, meaning you would take your baby to be baptized and you'd go home and bathe the baby to bathe it away. Um, that was a crime. Not being Catholic, going barefoot on Yom Kippur, bestiality, um, bigamy, blasphemy, burning hair and nails after cutting. Uh, Jews don't burn their hair and nails normally. They will... Um, they will throw them away or they will give them some, but they will not be burning them. So if, um, I'm sorry, they would be burning them. So this was a crime. Changing the sheets on Fridays, covering blood with dirt, uh, defacing a church, eating meat during Lent, eating on the floor, which they were eating on the floor during the, the morning period, eating meat on days that Catholics don't allow, like Fridays. Catholics did not allow to eat meat on Friday. And if you were eating meat on Friday, they knew that you were a either not a good Catholic and probably Jewish, um, faking to play cards at a table. So question, uh, sorry, um, eating meat during Lent should be a, oh that you ate it during Lent. My apologies. Continue. <laughs> Yeah, back in the day, you didn't eat meat all of Lent. I mean, yes. I didn't. I mean, it, it's not that far away. I grew up Catholic. I didn't eat meat during Lent. So, you know, when I was a kid. Um, the, the other one that's very important, and I actually have the family Barajas. Um, in Spanish, Barajas is cards, like you play playing cards, right? But Baraja is after Beraja, which is a, it's um, a, a blessing. So they used to take the cards and I have the family cards that did this. They used to take the cards and they would be playing cards and therefore they would be able to say the blessing after the meal and they pretended to be playing cards. So this is a biggie, uh, the faking to play cards. So counting stars on a Saturday night um, absolutely, because there was no one sending us a text and telling us that the Sabbath was over at 756. So they would go out and they'd point to the stars. Children were not allowed to point at the stars. I mean, the parents kept them from this. Um, fasting when it was not a Catholic fast, hechicería. Hechicería is a, a term that's used all the time. Basically, it's an herbalist, or a, and they used to call the, the herbalist or... Um, they used to call them like witchcraft, but they were mixing herbs. Um, and I, in, in, especially in the new world, less in Spain and Portugal, every second woman that got brought in in Lima was for hechicería or witchcraft. Um, fresh tablecloths on Friday nights, keeping the Sabbath, that's very obviously, killing animals in a specific way, not cooking on Shabbat and making the big stews that they kept, um, that they kept hot. Honoring the holiday of candles, Hanukkah, waiting for the Messiah, not having light in the home on Shabbat, washing hands before a meal versus after, which is what we do. Putting a newborn in a basin and throwing in gold coins um, is something that we do when a child, uh, a firstborn is 30 days old. Uh, it's, a, it's called a pity and a ben. And uh, you, depending on your family custom, you put sugar on the baby, you put, I mean, just to buy him back. It's, it's a whole ritual, but if they found any part of that ritual, uh, you would be brought in. Um, shaking bouquets of greenery, which would be the equivalent during Sukkot, soaking or salting meat, 
sodomy, sorcery, superstition. They would see a superstition, um, many of the things that we do. I mean, uh, shaking the boughs of greenery, which we do on Sukkot, was sometimes seen as superstition. Burning a piece of dough in a fire, wearing a clean shirt on Shabbat. I had two uh, grandfathers, uh, the 15th, I believe, and the 17th, I believe, that were actually killed for wearing a clean shirt on Shabbat. Uh, defacing a Catholic statue, putting a picture of Jesus or the Virgin in your shoe to walk on it all day. Um, everyone at a table drinking from the same glass, which is what normally, you know, people um, do in families with the Kiddush cup when you bless the wine at the meals and making fun of Christian statues. This is just a few of many. Dora? Okay, so how did a person find themselves in front of an inquisitor? What on earth? Okay, so let's say you did one of the above on the other page. Um, first of all, you were encouraged to turn yourself in as a heretic immediately, and you would get a lighter sentence. This grew into a lighter sentence for turning in your family member, your friends, and your neighbors. So it was a big free-for-all. A lot of the servants were offered to educate their children in, uh, let's say, um, in monasteries or in convents, which were the best schools at the time, if they would turn in their family. So there was a lot of incentive to be turning in your family. When a person was accused, he would testify before the tribunal, but was not allowed a lawyer. If he did not testify, it was an admission of guilt that was immediate. So there you were, and they're telling you you're gonna get a lighter sentence, and many people would come up and testify against him or her, family, other heretics, criminals. He was never told who his accusers were. So he didn't know, the person did not know who knew what, and he didn't have a lawyer. So this was across the board and very disconcerting. The accused usually had no witnesses because they too would be charged as heretics. They were afraid. So he was not always told what his crime was and instead would always, when he came in, would be asked, so what brought you here? You know, it's kind of like when you get caught speeding and the police officer says, so do you know what, how far, how fast you were going? What are you supposed to say? Um, so they hoped that he would tell them more than they actually knew. The inquisitions were, inquisitors were usually very well educated and would know how to ask leading questions to extract a confession. The inquisitors wanted a confession. They might be in prison for years before they would confess. In the meantime, several methods of torture would be used to extract a confession. If they did not confess, there would be a sentence of life in prison. Repeat offenders would be sent to secular authorities that would then order death. The Inquisition did not want to be associated, as I said before, with the actual killing. Dora? Dora? It's on my screen. You don't see the next one? In no. 1536? Uh-oh. Uh, okay. In 1536, the Portuguese Inquisition was established. How did it differ from the Spanish one? First of all, people had been doing this for a long time already because the Inquisition started about 1481. So here we are in 1536, people were getting very wise of it. So at the beginning, the Jews were allowed to enter Portugal after the expulsion, but had to pay a tax that became a windfall for the Portuguese government. In 1497, the king was not so keen on having the Inquisition in Portugal and even made Jews wanting to leave to sail through Lisbon and were coerced to convert or if they left Portugal, their children would be confiscated and given to Christians to raise. So a lot of people don't know this, that the Portuguese wanted the Jews to stay because the Jews, again, we spoke about it before, we're talking about the golden age. So they did not want them to leave. So they even said, okay, we're gonna take your kids away if you leave. So who's gonna leave their kids behind? Um, in Portugal, the Grand Inquisitor was chosen by the king and almost always came from the royal family. Bias again. He oversaw his council and the council oversaw the smaller tribunals. The bookstores 
where they, so he would overlook the tribunals, the bookstores, where they would confiscate and get rid of the books, uh, the confiscation of property of everyone else, they would overlook that. There were local tribunals with two or three inquisitors and two or three consultants. Public lawyers, notaries, commissioners were under them. This inquisition focused on the crypto Jews and conversos who were hiding uh, being insincere Christians. Next. Jora, next. Well, Jora. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know where Jora is. So I will try to keep going. I cannot. Jora, are you there? Jora is out. Okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen again and while it may not look perfect, um, at least uh, we'll get it going, okay? Um, let's see. Sorry about that. Okay. Here we go. So what happened to the money? The money was with a lot of this was about the money. Um, so what happened to the money after the confession? Having taken the lead from previous inquisitors, the inquisitors were many times out of their depth and de dealing very unfairly with those brought before them. If you were clergy, your punishment was less. A widow was dealt with more harshly than a married woman, a rich man and poor man also were treated differently as the poor one did not bring wealth with him to confiscate. The decision to condemn was a secret one, yet much information was leaking out and especially in the prisons of the new world. The person would be imprisoned and his goods would be confiscated and the imprisonment could last anywhere from a couple of months to a few years. The quality of food and the care that the person received while in prison, medical and otherwise, totally depended on how much money you had paid in confiscation of goods. So if you were poor on the outside, you were going to be poor on the inside. If you died in prison or were sentenced to death, the goods would be up for auction. This was more widely seen in Mexico City at that point all the money belonged to the tribunals. Whatever came in belonged to them. The Inquisition also always stated that the confiscation of goods paid for maintenance and costs. So communicating within the prisons. In some countries, there were regular prison cells, secondary cells, and the secret cells. The regular cells could have family visits. The secret cells were located in dungeons and usually underground, and very few knew where they were. Those that were sentenced to life in prison would be kept in one of the secret cells. So remember, we said before that you were not confessing, you would be sent to um, a life in prison in a secret cell. Those were horrible. Underground, dark, many people in the same place. In Cartagena, Colombia, there was a second type of cell for people that worked for the Inquisition and had committed some sort of crime. A person that was very ill would have limited family visits in the secret cell. Many died in these cells and the processes continued. They would be judged and sentenced in death. And if need be, their bones were later buried in effigy um, or buried, uh, burned in effigy or buried if exonerated. Women especially managed to communicate with the outside. We know women are very clever at these things. And the many opportunities were afforded to them. In Cartagena, Colombia, for example, the prison was located under the Plaza Mayor and small windows were open for ventilation, giving the prisoners an opportunity to speak with the outside. In Coimbra and other places, 50 to 100 people were put inside a cell and if the person managed to be set free, information from the inside flowed out free, uh, freely. So there was a lot more clever uh, ways to communicate with each other. Um, so there were, they were communicating so much from what was supposed to be a close in, you know, a total enclosure that even the bishops tried to intervene to stop it as people were conspiring to have similar testimonies. 
People could be heard talking through the walls. They sent each other hand signals or scratches on certain rocks. An entire system was done in this way. Um, ink was made from lemon juice and letters were pounded out in sequence on the dungeon walls. Prayers on the Sabbath were frequently heard in Mexico through the walls of those living nearby on the outside so that people um, could have the prayers. They would have this like, uh, there was a whole religious system made up, which was kind of Jewish Catholic. And um, a lot of this is still practiced in Portugal, by the way. So these prayers would be said loudly on the outside so they could hear it on the inside. Um, whatever, there was notes that were tied on the legs of the cats that would scurry through the halls, not knowing where the cat would end up. I think that's kind of dangerous. I'm not sure I would have put a note on a cat, but I think people were very desperate. Whatever was the method, the communications were full of sadness, anxiety, desperation, and hope. Thin cuts were made into avocados, bananas, and other fruit, and small notes were put inside. So basically um, the communications were happening. Okay, let me see. Okay, what's so sorry. You're okay though? Good, we'll I'm continue. sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, I think it's called Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, no, well, actually, I'm hardwired in, but yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Was it possible to escape death as a sentence? The result for those that were innocent was to be absolved. This could take many years. And in the meantime, the goods were confiscated for their food and upkeep. And then by the time you were able to get out, you had nothing. If you were found guilty, you would have a series of punishments, including beatings, life in prison, uh, more confiscations, wearing of the penitent garb we spoke about before uh, that was out in the, in the Auto da Fe called a San Benito, and you had to wear this for many years. When your sentence was up, and I just, just an FYI, when your sentence was up, that you would be in whatever village, they would take your San Benito, people knew it was yours, and they would hang it in the church, so no one ever forgot who you were. So it was like, there was no end to this. And, and it just went on and on. The ostracizing just went on and on. The only place that I physically have seen the San Benitos is in the Inquisition uh, Prison Museum in Lima, Peru. Um, so in some cases, you were sent out of the city. You were born in for several years. Many times they would banish you to Brazil. If you were from Portugal, you were sent to a seminary to learn Catholicism other than being sentenced to death or life in prison, all of the above would get you out of the jails. If you were caught again and again for the same type of crime, death was certain to be next. Many died in the prisons before heading to be burned to death. Being burned at the stake, and I said at the last minute, you could denounce Judaism and they would chop your head off. So I wanted to show you this. These are pictures taken by me a couple of years ago. This isn't like, from the 1500s. My husband, Michael, is in this particular dungeon over here on the left. And um, the, on the middle picture, you can see they would have about 100 people in that tiny airless room. They would paint it all black. So on top of the fact that you were just sitting in there with 100 people, the room was black. They just kept open for us to see a portion of the black room. You can see another one on the right. They were all the same, side by side by side. And these were the dungeons in Coimbra. Um, I wanted to show you the Canary Islands. On the left, we have the book of genealogies of everyone that passed the Canary Islands Inquisition. And why is this one like non-digitized. Why is this one super important? Because it was from the Canary Islands that the people migrated to Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic. Um, there was a lot of land grants for that. And there we go. There they are in that book. And I have been totally unsuccessful because the Inquisition so far, because I don't give up on anything. Um, I have been unsuccessful because in the 1700s, the Inquisition processos were stolen from uh, the Canary Islands and they went to England. 400 families bought them back. So they were brought back to, um, to the Canary Islands. And when I visited them repeatedly, 
Um, they, the 40, 400 families ha, are now still 400 families, but different people. And they have no desire. They don't understand. They asked me, why did I want to, you know, dig this up? It's black history. I'm hoping that now that we're going to have Spain on board, I'm going to be able to, to exert a little bit more pressure. However, the problem is that it's owned privately, whereas in Spain, Portugal, Mexico, it's owned by the government. So this may be uh, a problem. I wanted to show you on the left-hand side, uh, this is a mock-up of uh, Canary Islands, the island of La Palma, and you can see the light shining in the pure center. That was in the center of town, the whole Inquisition uh, plaza, let's say. Um, in Évora, Portugal, uh, this huge thing you see on the left-hand side that looks like an Italian palazzo, that was the house of the Inquisition. Um, and inside it is this hall. Now, I couldn't get the whole thing, but I wanted you to get the impression of this. This is, so as I stood under it and looked up, you can see the logo that I showed you at the front. It's right at the very top. It's about uh, 30 feet high. And as you look up, it would just be you and the Grand Inquisitor on a desk in front in the middle of this huge hall and very, very, very intimidating. Over here on the right in Evora, Spain, I'm sorry, Evora, Portugal, I took pictures of just some of the repositories. We walked through these repositories of Inquisition documents and other documents and this, this Evora uh, archive started in the 1400s. There were miles of, of this that you're seeing, they're all underground. Something that disturbed me a lot was this picture on the left. Um, I, I, I think of everything I saw, dungeons, whatever, what disturbed me was this picture that I showed you why. This is the entrance to the archdiocese, the seat of the Catholic church in Evora. And what is on top of it? The Inquisition logo. Look, you want to preserve the history, I get it, but you know, take it down, take it off, chop down the wall, do whatever you want to do, put it in a frame, put it inside, but hello. Um, I really struggle with this, so much so that I have contacted the church. I have become a nuisance about having the logo of the Inquisition on top of the seat of the Catholic Church. On the right-hand side was also something very disturbing. And as disturbing as this history is, it's important to tell. So when we visited this uh, Evora, uh, this that I showed you earlier, the big inquisitorial house, we, Michael, my husband and I walked through all the prisons and the cells. And then we came across this that looks like an innocent, beautiful yard. And it, so it seems that when people would die and there were so many, so many, so many, they just shoved them across the wall and threw them into this yard. And then when there was enough of these uh, Jewish bodies, they would take them out and they would um, throw them out as trash. I had gone with the two historians, my husband and a couple of other people. I always carry around the Jewish prayer for the dead, the Kaddish. I always have it printed. I, we carry it around with us. When we come, we all stopped. We said Kaddish there. I think it was probably the first time that, you know, maybe there was some sort of elevation of their souls. But this, this kind of nonsense, you see it still all over the place. Um, we're getting to the end. I want to show you my family tree, which just shows the people that were in the processos that were burned at the stake. We're all in olive green and um, goes back to 1405. I descend directly from the line that is in purple, but this at the bottom is only, um, let's say six, uh, maybe 16, 1700. So there's still another 15 generations um, after that. Um, however, there is always light and that's who we are as Jews. We go from darkness to light and we make a point of going from darkness to light. So I've recorded my own family history. Um, here are some of the books I've written. They're in English and they're in Spanish. And my 15 grandmothers, which was mentioned, um, all of them have won many awards. The last book I wrote was The Recipes of My 15 Grandmothers, which actually um, has recipes from the Inquisition. These 
grandmothers started writing them down and I have hundreds of pieces of paper. Uh, this is one of the things that they would do. They would eat uh, food that looked like pork chops, uh, but it's really French toast. It's, it's just bread and milk and sugar. And they would then burn a real pork chop in the in the fire to make the house smell like pork. And this particular other dish is called boyo maimong, which is a Maimonides cake. And I'm not the only one that is bringing um, darkness to light. There are many people. And one is my friend and colleague, Roni Treatman. And um, she is uh, from Venezuela. She works for Reconectar, which dedicates itself um, uh, to just put together the um, descendants and she's made these manuals in Spanish, English and Portuguese and you can get them on Amazon and it's just amazing. And that's how we are able to bring, you know, people like me, Ronit and many others, not that many others, but, but some others, um, you know, people are just starting to wake up to the need for the light. So, you know, it's very welcome and um, she especially wants to be able to share um, information on the hands-on because people that return, that's what they're missing. They're missing the hands-on. And if you convert or you return, you're pretty much starting from scratch. So thank you very much, Ronit. And I also want to thank Dr. Alicia Goshman de Bacal, who has studied the Inquisition documents of Mexico and written many important books and academic documents for her assistance because she is the one that knew a lot of the intricate information of uh, Spain, I'm sorry, of Mexico. And I wanna thank Professor Eugenio Alonso. Um, he's Cuban, lives in Miami, and he has tirely studied inquisition processos in Spain on the spot and has pre presented and written on the topic and both were invaluable. So thank you very, very much to all. And that's it. And thank you to you so much. And again, apologies. This is one of the things in Israel. You already have a question. I'm While um, I read Professor Alonzo's question, I'm going to allow people to open their cameras and microphones. I'd love to, with your permission, Jeannie, I'd love to have a little bit of a discussion. Sure. And, and allow people to ask questions in person. But in the meantime, how close are we to getting Portugal digitized and available? Okay. Hi, Eugenio, thank you so much for your help in this. It was invaluable. So we've got two huge reels that made their way to Israel last week of the Portuguese records and uh, they're being indexed as we speak. And we feel that a lot of the collection will be up online in the fourth quarter of this year. So, oh, there's Dr. Goshman. Thank you so much for all your help. There she yes. is. Somebody had a question, but I lost it. So if you uh, have a question I, either way. But, yes, so, Nicole. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the islands of Azores. Uh, was there any inquisition there? People were running from the inquisition to the Azores. I'm hoping that when we see the digitization of Portugal, there, Portugal right now on Torre do Tombo archives, they only have, I think it was 41% of Lisbon. People think that's it, no. So when we're going in, we're getting it all. Part of the collection includes the Azores as well as Goa, India, where there was an inquisition. So I'm hoping that as we do this, um, the Azores will be coming out via Portugal inquisition. Okay, and the reason I'm asking this is uh, because um, uh, I'm just wondering, since it was the furthest islands away from Portugal, uh, maybe people were spared, and that's why they ran away to the Azores and then to Hawaii and other places. Correct. Uh, I, I agree with you, but we will see if any of them were caught, they would be in the Inquisition records, or even if they were caught and they escaped. Now, interestingly enough, when I um, most of my DNA is Portuguese because the family went back and forth. But interestingly enough, I also uh, had an incidence of about seven percent of, of, of DNA from the Azores. So um, definitely, you know, there were people that were running away there. Yes. 
Okay, yeah, I know running away. The question is, were there any inquisition there? Were there any prisons there? Or And the second thing is, uh, I remember reading, I think it was about the Canary Islands, uh, some inquisition uh, uh, papers, and the person was in the jail, and basically they had to get everything from their family. They had to get their shoes and the, and the blankets, everything. In other words, they did not provide anything in the prison. So they will take out your goods, but they will not provide any goods. You have to get your family to bring you, you know, clothes and blankets and, and, and shoes and everything. Yeah. Unfortunately, Nicole, I, because of the situation of private ownership for the Canary Islands, it's very difficult to read in depth at uh, what was mm -hmm. really happening there different from the others. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand or put it into the chat. Um, one of the things, how many dungeons are there still across? I mean, I saw uh, that you were in some. And maybe um, I personally have been in the dungeons of Lima and me personally and in Coimbra and I have been in Evora um, and I haven't seen them anywhere. Maybe Dr. Goshman can tell us, I think she's here. Um, yeah, she's here. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Goshman, are there still any dungeons or prisons in Mexico? She has, she has to get her microphone open. Yeah, you're on mute right now. Doctora Goshman, puedes abrir el teléfono, el micrófono. I don't think she's, she's hearing us. I'm not sure. I have not seen dungeons um, anywhere, but personally, these three locations. Okay, but you can get a feel in general. Right, you definitely can get a feel. You see all the cells. Evora, people talk about Coimbra, but in that all underground of that huge, beautiful building, it's all the cells are there. Right, and Lisbon also, the main center. No, not in Lisbon. In Lisbon, they built an opera house. And then right. when the tour guide tells you, takes you, it says, uh, under this opera house is where it was. I, I have not seen them in Lisbon. So they don't exist anymore underneath? I don't believe so. I have okay, not seen I, them. Yeah, I was told that, that's why I was asking. <laughs> Yeah, no, I personally haven't seen them, but that doesn't mean anything. Then maybe they could be there. Okay. Since I want to thank you very much for joining us. Oh, here she's typing. Uh, Professor Alonzo is typing. He, sorry. I think there's one in the Castillo song. I'm going to pronounce it wrong because I... No, I'll, I'll let me just say it. So there's... he's. Uh, uh, he says that there's one in the Castillo San Jorge in Sevilla, but they will never tell you that. Only if you read, you know where it is the, by the building itself, still standing by the Guadalquivir. That's really interesting to go and see them. I mean, and it's very interesting to me when you started with the DNA memory. Um, oh, the epigenetics. Yes, that's really under heavy study right now. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of it, you know, going back to the Holocaust, but this is much further back. Yeah, you know? no, for sure. That's uh, very interesting. So, oh, we have, every time I want I to say thank I you. I have another, I have another uh, question. Is that you? Uh, yeah, Nicole. Um, the, um, um, uh, you said that Portugal really wanted to keep the Jews, but at one point, they did not want to keep the Jews. I mean, they wanted to keep the Jews at the beginning, but afterwards, they uh, at, at least uh, there is a story in 1493 about the 2,000 Jewish uh, boys uh, who were sent to Saint Tome. Mm -hmm. I mean, forcibly, forcibly sent to Saint Tome to Correct. populate the island of Saint Tome. So, so they but did 15, also. But in 1536, mm -hmm. When the economy started depressing, that's okay. you know that's when they um, wanted to separate the families from the children that wanted to go. But also, it was the refugee children that were sent. It wasn't the the no, people what who happened could. Is they gathered children, right? And, and that's very interesting. If anyone can get, there's a book on this. You can get it on Amazon on the history of Sao Tome. And um, that's very interesting uh, history that uh, very little is spoken about. 
and the children were gathered. They were sent to Sao Tome. A lot of them died en route. And are you a descendant, Nicole, of the children? Of no, um, okay. I, I did a study over there. I did a DNA study and okay. looking for, um, and what happened is in 1499, in Tori Tombo, you can see that later, uh, later in 1499, of those people who are in San Tome, and they and the captain that took them died, but the cousin of the captain is now taking care of the island. And those people are writing, you know, in a very um, elegant words to the king saying, don't worry, you know, the, the captain is dead, but the, right. his cousin is there taking care of the island. And it was signed by 65 uh, ma male names that were, you know, um, Spanish and Portuguese, you know, uh, uh, Jewish names. And uh, I did uh, go to the uh, island and did some a DNA study. And I also actually asked questions. I didn't know anything, even though I'm Jewish, I didn't know anything about the, um, the uh, nails and stuff. And I was, uh, but I learned about it just before I went there. So I asked everybody that I did a DNA study on, because I did a DNA study on the people that had names that were on the same, the same as this letter from 1499. I found 23 uh, of the names, not the 65. And um, uh, when I, I asked them all about what do they do with the nails? And I was surprised. There was uh, one of them was a judge. Uh, his name was Perez. And he, he uh, they were burning the nail. When they were cutting the nail, they would burn them. The, the you know the cut nails, they would burn them. The others, they would not throw it in the garbage. They would throw it all over the roof. Yeah, not in the garbage, over the roof. And so I felt there was some kind of symbolic thing. It was likely not in the garbage. In and the other enough. thing is the hair. Uh, and then the hairs. Uh, some people there save the hair every time the hair is cut. They save it in a bag. And then the, when the person dies, they put the bag with the hair with that person. And I want to tell you that I was in Israel recently and I was telling that story and somebody told me that Sarah Netanyahu <laughs> was saving her son's hair. No, by the way, I so, want to mention that um, in my mom's house after, you know, my mom's still alive, but she has Alzheimer's. When I went into her house and I took everything, I have incredible amounts of hair from the great, great, great grandmothers. So I'm looking into maybe I can do, even though we have all our DNA testing, maybe I can do some on that. Um, if you don't mind, Adora, I'd like to give a Ronit maybe a couple minutes to talk about her book. Ronit, are you there? Hi there, I am. And Hi. Thank you. I was not expecting to speak, so uh, well, you know, thank just you. That's uh, very generous of you to include me. I appreciate it. Um, well, I'm I'm actually originally Israeli, and then so and the way I came to this work was, as you're speaking about DNA, was through DNA, but from the other side. I'm I'm the other side of the mirror. I'm uh, Israeli. My father was an Israeli diplomat. We did our DNA test because uh, we have Holocaust survivors in the family. And, uh, you know, I didn't think I had anything to do with, with Iberia, the conversos, any of that. Um, but then I discovered that the Ashkenazi side of the family had been in Girona in, in Catalonia. And then uh, the way we did it was the matrilineal and patrilineal roots. And suddenly we we saw the family divide in two after the expulsion. And we see the side I'm from went to Italy and the Netherlands, and then they went to, uh, to Poland from there. But the other side stayed. And then at one point, I, I, and I've been told by a friend that this was when uh, Spain and Portugal were one empire. There was a period of about 80 years. They were one empire. And then it was possible to go to Brazil, even if you were from Spain. And so my, my ancestors went to Brazil from there. And I just um, had always been told there was nothing left, nothing Jewish left in Spain or Portugal, nothing. And uh, I was curious, so I went to see Giron. I wanted to see what it was. Um, and then when I came back, I published about this. And suddenly people started connecting with me on Facebook and, and telling me, you know, they're sort of uh, hinting at their secret Jewish life. And I just 
was really overcome with emotion. I just didn't believe it was real. Um, and I just felt this sympathy, this urge to help, which is a contrast to how uh, the community in Venezuela that I grew up with, with treated anybody who tried to, to approach the community. There had been at least one case I know of, of a man who said, I know I descend from Jews. I'd like to come back. And they told him, we don't want you. And it was both the Sephardic and Ashkenazi rabbi. And that was not, not racism and not discrimination. I, I looked into it. It was a remitic decision that had been made because they were protective of the community. They were worried about proselytizing, they were trying to preserve their community. So to, I mean, I know it sounds harsh, but it actually wasn't meant as an attack on him. They were just protecting themselves. Um, but I think it's time to move past it. I don't like it. I think it's time to be welcoming to any, and, and I mean, I don't go out and proselytize to anyone. I have never told anyone to convert and I never will, but if they have any interest in exploring their past, any interest in traditions, or their name or anything like that, I'm happy to be a resource. Great. Thank you, Ronit. And uh, definitely, you know, it's it's all our work together that brings darkness, a light to the darkness. Thank you exactly. so much. And thank you all so much for participating and thank you, Jeannie, for another wonderful talk. And I uh, look forward to hearing you many, much, much more because there's so much more to uncover there. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Jewish Heritage Alliance. Thank you, thank you Ronit. And we look forward to seeing you all soon.